Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Matt Watts, a writer and actor who's appeared in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, The Grand Seduction, Sensitive Skin, The Newsroom, the Ken Finkelman one, not the Aaron Sorkin one, and the fun short film Portal to Hell. He also stars with Bob Kerr in Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays, which returns to CBC this Sunday, January 15th, as Michael Every Day. Matt picked The Heartbreak Kid, Elaine May's 1972 comedy of manners starring Charles Grodin as Lenny Cantrow, a New Yorker who connives to woo a young woman in Miami while he's on his honeymoon. Written by Neil Simon from a short story by Bruce J. Friedman, and starring Jeannie Berlin as Lenny's new bride Lila and Sybil Shepard as his wasp crush Kelly Corcoran, the movie situates a conventional romantic comedy within a social and cultural minefield and comes up with something much more complicated and much more disturbing. There was also a 2007 remake with Ben Stiller. We'll talk about that. This is someone else's movie. I feel like it's it's the it's the film that most filmmakers have seen and know. There's like a weird love for Elaine May's work. Everyone knows those movies that yeah. is in the industry. Again, I came to it so late. Yeah. So how did you come to it? What was your, what uh, was your when did you find it? Uh, it was on the set of Scott Pilgrim. Okay. Michael Sarah recommended it to me. Nice. We were talking about uh, the Bob Newhart show, and we were talking about I I I, I had a weird in on that movie where I was in the the Rocket Club uh, action sequence. Mm. So I ended up being on set for two to three weeks. I can't remember. But then I got friendly with the art department. So they gave me a security pass. And also I knew Brian. Um, so I, I hung out on set for a long time. I wasn't... It's not like I would never claim to be friends with Michael Sarah, But we had moments where we got to talk. And he was so knowledgeable at his age. And we were talking about 70s comedy and the sort of subtlety of that. Because that's clearly what he's... A fan of and sort of emulating on on uh, Arrested Development, like he gets that style. And he said, "Oh, have you ever seen The Heartbreak Kid?" And I said, "No, I'd never, I'd never even heard of it." And I, I knew things like we, you know, Albert Brooks's Modern Romance, and so I knew that sort of genre. Right. And he said, "You should watch The Heartbreak Kid." So I went out, and I, fuck, it was impossible to find. Um, yeah, I th- it wasn't available. I until... think I, I think I found it at Bay Street at yeah. that point. I think they had, I think Bay Street had a DVD release of it. Um, yeah, well, again, with Anchor Bay, it wasn't available until later in the DVD wave. And I think it might have been one of the ones that was only released in the U.S. The one that I saw originally was 4x3. Oh, my God. And what's weird is, since then, the only decent version I found is a pirated version that I think someone recorded off Turner Classic Movies or something and put online. But I do have a 16x9 like AVI file of it that is pretty good no and it was on Netflix when Netflix first came to Canada uh, it was on Netflix so that's when I first started showing people because as as everyone was getting Netflix I kept saying this movie's on here watch it it's it's fantastic Um, and so that's that's how that's how I was introduced to it Uh, and I watched it and just fell in love with uh I just fell in love with that movie. I couldn't... I, I, and again, I, I don't know. I've lost count of how many times I've watched it. Um, but I just think it's... I think it's just such a phenomenal character study of a real rat of a guy. And how else can you... Like, just the layers of of insight into this film. The fact that as a female director, uh, a male uh, writer, and it's about a guy falling in love with another woman on his honeymoon... There's just so many layers of analysis going on that it, for some reason, or not for some reason, I think that's why it 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 just comes. It's so truthful, uh, the 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 pettiness and the and the desperation on his part. I don't think anyone else could have really captured it as well as Elaine May did. Now, obviously, what the Farrelly brothers did was just a complete shit show. Yeah, yeah. My God, it's no, it's horrible, and and we will. Uh, dissect that one in in, in due course because it's almost I mean we it's like you want to look through the original uh, th- uh, uh, using the lens of the remake because it just the remake just shows you how great the original is by how much they miss the point it is bizarre I mean there's this I've been trying to figure out how to juggle it because the thing that drives the heartbreak kid in the, its original version 
And the thing that guts me that I've never been able to see it in, in with a 1970s audience yeah. is the, the whole thing about the, the Jewish and Gentile attraction, which now just feels like a relic of a different time. I mean, they're, they're, you know, daddy wants us to go to another club because he doesn't like the element here. Yeah. That stuff would have played very differently. Yes. And, you know, it opens with a Jewish wedding, which again, early 1970s studio picture, that's, that's groundbreaking in it's, a weird way. If you're not making Duddy Kravitz, like if you're not making a film that's about a, the Jewish experience. No. And, and, and Charles Grodin, although it's not stated that he's Jewish, he's, He's, I, I'm assuming he's supposed to be. Well, they're not wearing. Yeah, it's funny because they're not wearing yarmulkes, but he does step on the glass. Like, yeah, either it's a if it and if it was a mixed marriage, they wouldn't have a rabbi officiating. Right. Rabbi. Okay. They're doing it in a house instead of a. So they're they're, you know, they're reform or they're they're conservative at best. They're not orthodox. They're not observant Jews. But this is a Jewish story at yes. the beginning, and then and Neil Simon who wrote it. So and, and Elaine May, there's no way they're not paying attention to this stuff, right? And the fact that the sort of dark-haired, uh, you know, Jewish-ish, spoiled Jewish American princess caricature, yeah, yeah, and then he goes down and falls in love with a blonde supermodel, yes, <laughs> a walking stock of corn, yeah, yeah. by uh, so Sybil Shepherd, Shepherd. Uh, who is also very clearly toying with him, yes, and aware that she is his superior from the word go. It's yeah. really. Loaded. It's interesting because I when I I don't it she is such a plot device of a character because it in my opinion because it is really about him, mm-hmm. um, but they really just they make her as three dimensional as as they can without making it about her. Mm-hmm. So yes, the toying with him, the 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 leading him on when when they're in Florida when he gets to Minnesota and he pursues her. Uh, then she, I mean, this is the the part that's a little bit unbelievable. She falls for it and falls yeah. for him. And then they get married at the end. Like it is, it's like, it's so, so that's the part where I go, did, would she really, what, what, is, how is she so charmed by him? And then I think, well, I guess it's believable in the sense that he's just spewing so much bullshit, especially at that dinner that, and she's not, although she's toying with him, she's not meant to be the brightest person. Yeah. So I guess she was just taken by the fact that he's charming and, and is manages to scatter her, her other suitors, bullshits her father, and, and uh, you know, it, it, he, he scores a touchdown, essentially. Yeah, he's driven in a way that no one else in the film is. No. But that's because he's a sociopath. Yeah. He's <laughs> well, bordering on. Is he a sociopath or is he just supposed to be a man? Like, that's the thing that I keep yeah. looking at and I go, he's not... He's he's ridiculous, but it's all believable. I mean, I don't think I would ever go to that extent, but there are so many elements of his behavior that I uh, acknowledge and recognize as something that I've done in my life. That it's such a it's such a scathing character study of male behavior that I can't deny it. It looks sociopathic, it looks narcissistic, but then it's like, eh. yeah. Well, I think that. You or I or most of the people in, in an audience for this film recognizes elements, but as the character, Groden is so good at shutting down every other part of himself yeah. and playing just want, right. and desire, and need, and watching him convince himself that this is going to work... And then start trying to convince others. It's fascinating because you can see these decisions happening behind his eyes in a split second. But you know also that where it's all coming from is a place of the want. He wants the want, right? Like he doesn't know what he actually wants out of life. So he's just pursuing it. Uh, You know, it, it starts with him meeting a girl in a bar and getting married. And clearly it's because he thinks he should. Right. Well, I mean, that very first shot of him is him rehearsing. Right. The with the pipe in the, in the mirror. Yeah. yeah hello. Yeah. Hello. Like he's prepping for something. Yeah. And then and then the idea that he's irritated by uh, Jeannie Berlin's character where that's I find that so interesting, too, because it's like they're setting it up for us to dislike her. They want us to think that she is so irritating, he's going to leave her because she's irritating. Right. But her, her, the things that make her quote unquote irritating are very minor human behaviors. So we're watching it through his eyes and we're getting irritated with her. But when you actually look at it closely, 
she's lovely. Like, yeah. she's just a human being that has flaws like everybody else. Yeah. And it's supposed to be a little grating, but not to the point where, you know, you go run running away from it. Yeah. The idea that she would be such a monster as to drive him away, that's not happening. I mean, that's ha- that happens in the remake because yes. the Farrelly's have no subtlety and can't understand that the idea of... You know, the, the the whole point of the Heartbreak Kid is that he is destroying people. That's where the name comes from. Yeah. And for the Fairleys to see it and think, oh, his heart's getting broken. No, that's that's not that's not what this is. The Fairleys made his character sympathetic and uh, completely without uh, responsibility. He, like he, he he it's everything's happening to him. So his friends push him into this marriage that he he doesn't think he's ready for. Right. She, she turns out to be crazy nightmare like off the charts two-dimensional cartoon insane right and also by having it be Malin Ackerman it completely short circuits the concept of of the original film which is that she's the, just a regular the Jewish character is trading up or sees this as a ladder as a, not a lateral move but as a as a vault right he wants he doesn't just want Sybil Shepherd, he wants everything she represents. Maybe maybe in the Farrelly's mind that's what they thought they they thought if the first uh, woman is I like a picturesque sort of beautiful woman. And then, uh, it's Michelle Monaghan who I guess, I mean, I, I think she's stunning, but she's, but, yeah, and but she's, but she's delightful she's, screen, presence. but going from the blonde haired, uh, uh, beauty to, it's like going from ginger to Marianne. Sure. So in that, in, in, in the fairly brothers mind, maybe they thought that would have, it would accomplish the same thing. Mm. It's like, he's going from this hot model type, to just sort of a, a beautiful girl next door type, so that that's the same kind of thing. I don't know. It, it does it, like they're thinking. They're they're saying, look at he's he's going for a, a more well rounded person. Right. She might not be as beautiful, but she's normal. So yeah. and it's and it's like that's again not the point. So yeah, then it sells it, out the concept. Just yeah, it totally sells out the concept. Absolutely. And the constant misunderstanding I just yeah I remember seeing it I, I had seen the original when I went to see the remake and I just remember getting angrier and angrier and angrier realizing that like, Ben Stiller probably really gets the original I mean yeah I'm how sure, can he not yeah he was raised in it yeah like, he knows that world he knows the people I cannot believe he is making the movie the Farrelly's are making I refuse to believe I, I will not accept it but he did like the only way to get I, I think to his mind maybe or the studio situation the only way to get the movie made was to make the package put together there's something about Mary put him with Ackerman because she kind of looks like Cameron Diaz and maybe that reminds people like the, I think oh I didn't even think about know, like, that if you think about the cell that must have gone through because this this fascinates me about remakes there's this you know the, the appeal of the remake is that it has a built in audience theoretically the property is recognized it is a less contentious pitch it's an easier sell to the studio to get them to make it because they already own it it means they'll be able to resell the original version everybody wins in but they didn't do that with the heartbreak kid that's what i don't understand is why like why i wonder if the Farrelly's actually really like that movie so much that they thought let's remake it it's possible but they just don't understand it yeah they didn't get it at all how can it i mean again i guess that's the point right how can a couple of I guess Methodist guys from Rhode Island make a movie about those relationships and that dynamics, and then they, you find out, oh, they didn't. They but, just didn't try. But they're crude guys, you know. So it was it was one of those things where I thought, well, maybe they'll appreciate uh, the anal- an analysis or exposing of crude male behavior. Sure, like they, you know, since all their films are that, um, it's it's kind of ironic that this is the one that isn't that where they they make uh, the woman the crazy crude one uh, and Ben Stiller just sort of reacts to it mm-hmm. um, so I thought well again this is what you do is uh, obnoxious male behavior how can you make the heartbreak kid and not make the main character obnoxious or or make him the one making the poor decisions or, or pushing for like the the that whole subplot with um, those twins that uh, he told at the wedding that his wife had died, had been murdered. Oh, that's right. So that when they're in Cabo, 
the Michelle Monahan's family assumes they heard that his wife had been murdered. So when he finds out that they know about his marriage situation, he assumes they know that he's married, but they think it's that his wife was murdered. Right. So that's like 20 minutes of misunderstanding that takes all the responsibility off of him. Yeah. And it's, it's like, but that, and that, it doesn't make sense. Like, narratively, there's just no reason for any of the stuff that happens in the Farrelly Brothers version. And it's, like, 45 minutes longer than it needs to be. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't believe how long it was. It was like, why is this over two hours? The the first one's, like, an hour 45. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no need. Uh, and it's just bad. Yeah. It's bad. But it does, again, like, I would almost recommend that people watch the, the remake first. Yeah. And then experience what it, this concept is actually supposed to be and see how it plays. That first movie is so good. It's It's... It's a, uh, and a lot of it is on Groden. Uh, a lot of it, he carries that film in a way. Uh, I mean, Je- uh, Jeannie Berlin and and Eddie Albert, right? Like it's just mm-hmm. it, they and they were nominated for Oscars, right? Jeannie Berlin yeah, and, and yeah. Eddie Albert. Uh, there's, I was when I was watching it again last night. The, I, I watched both of them. Um, the scene where he says, "I'm going to lay out all my cards," and it's it's him, Sybil Shepherd, Eddie Albert, and uh, and Audra Lindley. Audra Lindley yeah. And it's one take, right? That it's like a, a sort of a master shot of a, of all of them sitting around the table, uh, and they're still in Miami. Uh, and he's, you know, here are my cards. I'm I'm gonna come to Minnesota. I'm married right now. All that kind of stuff. And you just watch Eddie Albert fume yeah. and Audra Lindley sort of occasionally start to say something but stop, and Sybil Shepherd sort of playing with her food. Uh, and stifling a few laughs a couple times. Mm-hmm. It's just so stunning and perfectly played out. Uh, and and it, 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 there's cinema just doesn't do that kind of stuff anymore. Yeah. The first time I saw it, I didn't notice. I just watched the scene. Yeah. And then watching it again a couple of weeks ago, I was floored because it's... I mean, this is yeah, it's the connection to Cassavetes. It, it's like yes. it's experimental American cinema. Yeah, in the middle of this Neil Simon script. Yes, where it's just like, no, this is how we're going to do it. We're just going to trap everybody in this space with the audience, and you. It's excruciating. It's it's that it's such a brilliant uh, sort of perfect storm of film at that time mm-hmm. with, with the Cassavetes stuff. You know, I hadn't seen Mikey and Nikki until recently either, and uh, I think it's the best. Cassavetti's film period okay he just didn't direct it do you know what I mean like I'm sure he had a lot of say I'm sure right. that it wasn't just but, a, a lane but but in terms of the expression of his cinema yeah, yeah you know what I, I mean like that. it was such a so that it's that Elaine May harnesses that style really well in in especially in in the heartbreak kid like it, it that 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 feel of cinema the way that she understands men is another thing because it just between I mean, it's fascinating when you look at her four films. Um, uh, a New Leaf is about her, but it's also very much about uh, Walter Matthau's character. Yeah. I mean, it is. He's the protagonist, and but uh, she's got a lot of great stuff to do. So it sort of takes the focus off of him a bit. But it is a study in uh, Walter Matthau's character. Ishtar is about, you know, Dustin Hoffman and, and uh, Warren Beatty. And then... And Mikey Nicky's about Cassavetes and and um, Peter Falk, and then this is about Charles Grodin, and they're all fucked up, damaged, <laughs> deluded men. And she, which I mean, I appreciate that. Obviously, most cinema is about that, but there's something about how she handles it that shows a raw nerve that no one else really does. It's it's easy to write flawed men. But she writes them or exposes them in a way that is so uh, frighteningly accurate. Yeah, exposes is exactly the word I was going to use. I was, I was just about to say people have made movies that study these men, but she exposes them. There is never an excuse allowed yeah. in her movies. You just you, even when characters win, uh, as as Grodin does, yes. when he triumphs. He's a piece of shit. Like, we know. We've watched everything he's done. Yeah. None of this is for his own happiness. He'll never be happy. And it's funny that a lot of people will watch a film like that and go, well, I didn't really like Charles Grodin very much in it. And it's like, yes, that's the point. You're actually seeing what a shitty human being can do. And the enjoyment comes out of watching him try to learn 
He doesn't even really try to learn, does no, he's, he? He's learning the behavior. It's, he's learning what to do, but he's not learning from it. And then, yeah, exactly. And that, and that, the wedding at the end is the ultimate lesson. It's almost like in that moment, he may understand that he's never going to be happy, or we're just aware of the fact that he's never going to be happy. Yeah. Either way, he's never going to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> it's so he shouldn't great. Be. He doesn't deserve it. Like it's 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 yeah. I, my 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 button. Uh, invariably, this comes up all the time, uh, in in comedy and drama, is when a film doesn't understand that it's depicting something we shouldn't be happy about. Right. But the heartbreak, it absolutely does. Yes. Like the movie knows that what he's doing is not right. Right. Even as he convinces himself and everyone around him that it is. Right. And it's amazing because there is no release. There is no... You know, he gets he gets to have sex the way he wants to. Yeah. That's the only thing that comes close to being triumphant where he gets that little speech about how I knew it could be like this. Yeah. But But even then, you know what's funny is that I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't I think he, he's just convinced himself. Like it's one of those, you know, uh because he, he I, I, in that moment when he, because I know the exact moment he's lying there and and Sybil Shepherd is it, it's almost like he's saying that in the same way that Jeannie Berlin's character was saying it that's that's the thing that I find really fascinating is he becomes the Jeannie Berlin character in a way where he says the 40 or 50 years yeah. and he's just kind of like chasing Sybil Shepherd down in a way and he's he's on the hook and she's being kind of aloof so it's like the sex was good because he needed it to be good. Yeah. So who knows if it was good? He's just, he's convinced himself it would be good. Yeah. Or it's the, I mean, or it's not even, or it's the chicks of goddess thing. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. Just, right. He's right. He's right. trained to believe that right. they wrote a whole song about it in the last five years. He's been trained his whole life because he's always been othered. Yeah. Uh, outside of his own community. Like this is the goal. So of course it's going to be better. It's going to be great. And it's just so like skin crawling. And how do you think the stuff with Eddie Albert played in that? Like in nineteen seventy. Well, what I mean is that. So what, what the question I'm asking is, if this were the sort of, uh, uh, if this was about you know a, a Jewish male uh, entering into the sort of um, um, the Gentile enclave. the Gentile yeah. enclave. It's a great way of saying that. Yes. Uh, the then there would be an instinct to think that Eddie Albert's character doesn't like him because he's Jewish. It's probably part of it. Do you think so? Oh, he's definitely, I mean, because I, because for me, I don't see that. All I see is that he doesn't like him because he's a piece of shit. Well, there's that too. (laughs) Like you can go, you, it can be, and the thing that's great about Albert's performance is it could be read either way. There's never a moment where it becomes about ethnicity. Right. But there's that early line. You're like, daddy doesn't like the element here. And, it's Miami. That's, right. It's a. It's not a restricted club. They go to what is it, the Jockey Club or something. They, they go to the Jockey like, Club. But I that sounds a lot more white. When he when she says I didn't like the element here, I assume that it just meant him. Like it also was, possible. Yeah. But it was just like that's that's a subtle way of saying he wants me to get away from you because yeah. you're hanging around and. Also, I mean, he's like 36 and she's like 20. Yeah, they never explore it. He's 15 years older than either character. Right. Than either Berlin or Shepard. Yeah, yeah. And that works. I think that works against... I mean, it plays against Groden's type because is he, you know, is he this old and, and unattached because he's a wallflower? Is he Charles Groden as we like to imagine him, like neurotic and and withdrawn? Well, or the age thing is never really discussed. Yeah. So his age is indeterminate, but I guess. what has he been doing? Because he's even if he's only supposed to be five or six years older, right. why isn't he married? What, right. what has he been doing? This whole sporting goods thing, we never see him sell a sporting good, but he does have a badge at one point. Which is funny because, uh, oh, right, which I assume is a fake badge. I, I thought it was too, like a but, novelty badge. But, but where does he get it? But then... The, the remake, they try to explain that, right? The fact that he was engaged for five years and that didn't work out and all his friends are getting married. And so, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess this is, when I was watching it, I went, well, this isn't bad. Like, yeah, it's, it's how you account for Ben Stiller being 40. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, that was I'm the other thing, too. Love. I remember thinking, uh, wow, why are they going with a 40-year-old who hasn't been married? Charles Grodin wasn't that old. And then I looked up how old Charles Grodin was and it turned out he was 36. He was close, yeah. Oh, my God. But that's also... That Charles Grodin toupee yeah. <laughs> it is so obvious and large 
it does age him down a little bit. I didn't know he was 36. I would have put him closer to like 32. Yeah. It was the massive sideburns for me. They're just, they're, they're, I couldn't tell if it was a character point, like he's trying to be 70s stylish and failing, or if it's just a bad wig, but it's, either way. Maybe it just, it was a bad wig that they needed to blend in with the sideburns. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating because it shouldn't, again, it just makes him more awkward and, and less likely to court someone like Sybil Shepherd. But then I suppose this character is less likely to court anybody. He's, he's not courting, he's preying on her. Yeah, he's preying on her and he's charmless. But for some reason, she finds it charming, I guess, in the way that no one has pursued her so, uh, uh, like, obsessively. Yeah. Um, I she mean, this reads it as passion, possibly. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. I could see that. She, he, he, he says nothing to her that he's in, he is even remotely charming. Just that he's into her, and then he's going to follow her, and that uh, he's never met anyone like her. Right. Uh, it's that weird scene in the car in Minnesota after he's been sort of stalking her around the school, and uh, and he says, "Well, screw it. I'm just going to go back. Then forget it." And she goes, uh, you know, give a girl a chance. And then they kiss. And it was like, what? What happened there? Okay, I guess, I guess that's, again, those are the little, those little turning points I find flawed mm. by today's standards um, that they could have improved on if they, you know, made a remake that was even remotely on right. point. And I was trying to figure out if the psychology of, of Shepard's character is such that she needs him to give up before she gives in. Well, and she's... Yeah, she's clearly supposed to be a character who gets what she always wants and enjoys uh, being pursued. But uh, so that would make sense yeah, to once, what you're saying. Once she proves she's unwinnable, then he can have her. Right. But it's so weird and pathological. I mean, everybody in the film has a pathology, which is absolutely fascinating. Even, you know, Lila is just a little too self-assured because that's how she gets sunburned. She doesn't, you know, I don't need it. Right. And then she overdoes it with the cream because she's genuinely sorry and in pain that she's done this to herself, but it becomes loathsome uh, I, in, I in his feel, eyes. In his, in, in his eyes. To me, it's like, and, and to the audience, it's just this poor woman. Yeah, it's vulnerable. Oh my God, this poor woman is just trying to have a good uh, honeymoon and spends the entire time in the hotel room burned to a crisp. And her husband just keeps running in and out because he's lying about spending time with Sybil Shepherd. Yeah. And lying about everything. Everything. To everyone. I mean, it's just, the, you know, it, it's it's not a farce exactly, which is, I think, the reason the Farleys were attracted to it because of the farcical elements. Right. Which they then clearly played up to their own detriment. Oh, my God. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be... I I think you're supposed to empathize with the disaster with the destruction that he leaves in his wake in the original in May's like May's clearly not approving of anything that happens yes and then with the Fairleys it's like there's this clown show that goes on where everything else is also people falling over and people tripping and all the stuff that happens with Ackerman and she's a good sport and she'll do whatever it takes not as a character but as an actor yes but it just it serves nothing it doesn't forward it doesn't drive the story forward it doesn't help our understanding of anything it doesn't illuminate the characters it's just crap that gets thrown on people those those farce qualities in that one the ackerman with the acrobatic sex yeah the oh right the donkey stuff uh it's just so vile yeah and i was just thinking about the in the original what's so great is that everything is kind of horrible yeah. Uh, remember in the in the nightclub, and there's that bad magician. Oh, yeah. Da 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 da. Just repeating that. I couldn't tell if he was supposed to be a magician or a comic. He's doing just, a magician. He's just supposed to be a bad entertainer. But it's horrible. It's horrible, yeah. and they're all kind of watching it and accepting it. And and uh, he says, "Oh, oh, Sybil Shepherd touches." Uh, Groden's leg under the table mm -hmm. and he lets out like a, a startled moan and then he to cover he says oh no it, I was just enjoying the show and Audra Lindley just lovely, love, lovingly says oh isn't he wonderful or something like that and just and it, but it's like no it's all bad and they all know it's bad nothing here's good they're all and all these people are just kind of terrible yeah. and 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 that's what I think Elaine May just revels in it she loves these characters for all their flaws and loves exposing them 
and and that's that's what the film is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they're lying to themselves even about this. Yeah, about every little thing. There's that sequence where you know this is supposed to be what is it? It's not the shrimp cocktail. There's something else that he orders that's supposed to be the best in the world, or the best in town. That's this whole point. Oh, the pecan pie. Pecan pie. Yes. The pecan. Yeah, the pecan pie. <laughs> and it's this endless sticking point. And that was like the first time I saw it. I think that's where it all falls into place. Is like, oh, he doesn't actually care about it he wants it yeah it's a thing that he's decided to have right and then everything else just sort of snaps into place right and you realize just how horrible this is this yeah. whole experience has been for me the viewer and the second time through it's like did people laugh like this was this a comic high point in the 70s it couldn't have been i'd love to see that film with an audience do you know what I, there are certain films that I, i've always seen without an audience and you chuckle to yourself or you smile Mm. And then you see it with an, like Strange Love is one of those movies that I saw so many times as a kid, and I saw it once at the Royal. I took my dad. Oh, that would play so differently with an audience. It the laughter was constant. It, it played like a real comedy, and I I just I couldn't I couldn't believe it. It was so nice. It was so great to experience. So Heartbreak Kid is another one of those things. Where I'd love to see it with an audience. I'd love to see how they react. I'd love to see if there would be a crowd crowd laughter especially with stuff like the pecan pie like i know on certain lines like going pee pee and you know those kinds of things would get laughs but when he's so adamant about that fucking pie yeah and then tells her that they're getting a divorce and then she's trying not to throw up at the table i would think that would like it would be that sort of groaning uncomfortable yeah, it laughter was painful to watch yeah but times for me. you know really funny yeah it's i mean it's weird to imagine that because like my, my point of comparison is stuff like Woody Allen's 70s films. And it's weird to think of this as anywhere near that world because they are, I mean, they're sort of concerned with the same issues. But Allen always found a way to put the, the bulk of the joke on himself or on the situation. My closest comparison is modern romance. Like, okay. Because I feel like that... You know, you've, oh, yeah. So I just feel like that that, in terms of that despicable male, except... Albert Brooks is a, is a little bit more likable than Charles Grodin mm-hmm. because he's directing himself. And he's yeah. So it's the more he's the more fun, neurotic Woody Allen type. Uh, whereas Grodin, I guess you're right. I guess he's a sociopath. Like there, <laughs> but but well, Brooks invites us to enjoy his character suffering. Right. Like we're allowed to laugh at him. We're encouraged to laugh at him. Right. And still feel for him. And he's suffering because it's his own fault, and he sort of knows it. I guess with Grodin, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's yeah, so unaware. he has unaware. no self-awareness yeah. that, that he becomes... A monster. Yeah, a predator. Yeah. Like, in, in that he is... Would you even have used the word stalking? Does she use the word stalking? No, no but he's clearly stalking. Yeah, in 72, I don't know that that would have been thrown around. But it's that kind of stalking that is... Uh, well... I mean, it, it, it wouldn't in in seventy two. There's no internet, so he has to go to Minnesota to find her. He sure. has to get a hotel room to because where else is he going to live while he's there? Um, right. Nowadays, you just find them online and and send them an email. So, I it, the the intent would be the same. Uh, whether or not that scene is stalking, I, I mean, if you kept pursuing it after someone asked you to go away. She doesn't ask him to go away. Her dad does. Mm-hmm. So that's where it gets tricky. Because she's like, yes, come over. I didn't think you'd, you'd show up. I didn't think you'd actually follow through on it. But she yeah. never says no to him. She's not afraid of him. No, at all. At yeah. all. She's not afraid of him at all. In a she's... way that she probably should be. Right. Or or not. Like, it's one of those things where he walks that fine line of he's he's ultimately harmless. He just really, really wants to be with her uh, to a point where it starts to get creepy. But just knowing that the world that they inhabit... It doesn't seem that abnormal. Yeah, it's well. I think that's what's so unsettling about it is realizing that this is this sort of thing happens or happened at the time, played out exactly the same way all the time. Men asking for the women's hands in marriage, yeah, refusing to be from the outside. It would be like it could be a charming story you tell at a wedding. Yeah, it, and it kind of is. Probably it's right. How, it's how he sees it. Well, you know, I was with the wrong person, and I fell, and I met her, and I couldn't take my eyes off her and I followed her all the way back to Minnesota and she wasn't sure but I talked to her dad and I won him over and from his perspective that's what happened that's great that's a great way to frame the movie too because it is it is it's like if you were to if you were to remake that film 
then how great would it be to open with that wedding speech, right. but then see actually the, the events that unfolded right. in the way that we see them in this film. So it's almost like that's just the one element that's missing is, is, is the fact that it does sound when you write it out like a bit of a fairy tale story. Yes, it was an unfortunate thing. Like there's the two sides of it. Yeah, yeah. The basic premise of he fell in love with someone else on his honeymoon is a great comedic premise of how disgusting a human being can be. <laughs> right. But the flip side of it is you're absolutely right. Him saying, I was with the wrong person, but then I met you and this all made sense and I followed you across the country to win your hand. Yeah. It's it's sleepless in Seattle. Yeah. Like, you explain it just there. It's like, yeah, it's sleepless in Seattle. Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. Because that one unnerved me at the time that nobody understood that Meg Ryan basically is insane, that she falls in love with a voice and abandons that nice Bill Pullman and goes off and finds Tom Hanks and stalks him until she connects to him. But, but you know... Nora Ephron made it sweet. It's hard to know based on my... I mean, I've never pursued anyone like that but I, I assume it happens I mean these things are not complete fantasies yeah so, and we're certainly encouraged to believe in this sort of thing happening yeah in I, a positive way I don't look at the heartbreak kid and think this movie is a complete piece of fiction it, you know the I know it was based on a short story mm-hmm. which I've never read yeah me neither actually but, I couldn't find it by Bruce J. Friedman yeah I'm guessing he either he must have it lived it or knew someone that it had that experience. I wouldn't be surprised. Like where else, it's, yeah, where else would you even come up with the concept? It's not a crazy story. It's not that outrageous, right? Like, it's 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 a completely believable uh, series of events. It's just about how you interpret it and whose side you're on. And I think, again, that's what Elaine May did so well, was interpreting that story and really making sure that you don't sympathize with Charles Grodin at all yeah. that you dislike him but it's about the elements of yourself that you recognize in his character because it is there's a lot of moments of like oh god just shut up and go away you know, or just go back to your wife and just sort this out properly or you know you're you're just you're falling in love with uh, an ideal uh, she's not a person you don't know her right mm-hmm. like you're just watching all these things but you're like fuck when people fall in love with you know images all the time yeah, it's a. I mean, there's a. Oh, now I just want to see a mumblecore remake of it that gets it, <laughs> that gets it right. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Tell that story in a really small space. Like, yeah. It's not impossible to make this movie cheaply, and and I mean they did it the first time. But the that's what I love about it too. Yeah. Just to, on that side, but it is this is when I look at those films uh, and, and Cassavetti stuff too, right? Like like Opening Night or or, or Woman Under the Influence. I wonder a Woman Under the Under the Influence especially because. That is such a small film. I mean, it mostly takes place in the house. It was going to be a play. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. They originally they were going to do it as a two part, of course, theatrical experience, and then they realized very quickly that it would kill them if they did it. Oh, night after that, night, yeah, trying that, to do that. that, that it, was, oh, yeah. it was going to end with the first half ends with her going off to the asylum, and the second half is her return. And then the and, fake party. And yeah, you yeah. just yeah. That would be yeah. well, it, would, it would not it, have survived. It, that movie devastated me. I don't think I've cried more during any film. Uh, than that movie and it just sort of came as a shock but the fact that those films are so engaging Heartbreak Kid like that era of filmmaking is so cheap yeah. <laughs> to do yeah. but it's so engaging and compelling and I, I can't believe that audiences won't see films like that uh, because they're not big expensive um, uh blockbuster type films it's a movie like did you see Nasty Baby last year yeah yeah. see I mean like I I don't know how well that played a friend recommended it and I watched and I thought this is fantastic I don't understand why these movies aren't getting more release I mean I know that there's a whole business model I'm not sure it opened theatrically here I know it played I think it played Inside Out it played a festival that's where I saw it right but it didn't I don't think it opened but even yeah even with Kristen Wiig and, and I don't understand I mean I, I know there's a whole reasoning behind it and it's money and it's studios and then it's the distributors and all that kind of stuff but uh, well I mean we're, li- we're literally living in a world where Kelly Reichardt's new film that has Kristen Stewart in it can't open in Toronto right like will not play it's gonna go straight to video it's and I guess that's the model now right it's 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 a uh, it's a video on demand or Netflix kind mm-hmm. of thing and that's where you hope to make your money back yeah, but theatrically, I mean, there's nothing like seeing a film, especially a film like this, yeah. in a theater with other humans who yeah. are reacting to it 
at a different speed or for different reasons or coming at it from a different angle than you are because that's the whole point of this movie. It's about the different prisms that you can see it through. I have some hope. Again, it is like the heartbreak kid will make you laugh, but it doesn't have big jokes in it. It has very small... Um, awkward moments yeah. that will make you cringe and then possibly laugh because of how human they are. Like the the, the original uh, UK Office, right? I mean, it doesn't have a lot of laughs in it, but it has. It's very funny. Yeah, well, and it's the also I think the type of comedy where you start looking for a release. Yeah. And so when the laugh does come, it hits a lot harder. Yeah. Like there's that bit where Keith eats a scotch egg in, in like the third or fourth episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. apparently the funniest thing in the entire series because it breaks the tension. Yeah. But it's just a guy eating an egg. It's not even especially funny. But if you, like, I remember there was, a, there was an extra section on one of the DVDs where they dissect it because it was so fascinating. That moment? Yeah. That's hilarious. And it's all in the timing. And, and Gervais is absolutely right. It's the way it's cut and it's the way... The actor pauses for a split second before he actually puts the thing in his mouth. Yeah, and then just takes a giant and bite out of it. Just blows the, the scene wide open. Yeah, there's nothing quite like that in the Heartbreak Kid. Even when even when Groden shouts uh, at the at the table in front of the magician, there's like it's a desperation. It's not an explosive release, but be, yeah, because we're waiting, we're so starved for any kind of emotion. I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything later, like when he goes. It's all Eddie Albert. It's yeah. it's that There's Eddie a jump cut from the I will stop at nothing. Like what'll it take to buy you? And then it cuts cuts to the, to the wedding. That's something. But also just Eddie Albert's complete distaste for him and uh, the anger, the you know, get yeah. out of here, you newlywed, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. What is he? It's I would I'll punch you in the goddamn mouth. Like I'm sure that got a laugh. Yeah, I'm originally. sure. I would think those kinds of moments got laughs. Especially watching Eddie Albert, who everyone loved from Green Acres, being angry at all, furious, and then just seething and with then rage. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would that would have broken a barrier, I think, at the time. And and it obviously laughs from uh, um, uh, uh, Lila in in the sure in, in the car, and I gotta go pee pee, and you know the the egg salad sandwich scene. <laughs> is so funny I mean and that's played mostly for Charles Grodin's reaction to it but it's genuine and it's funny and it's just like yeah it's disgusting but it's human again it's just that kind of thing where she just doesn't know uh, you know the Civil Shepherd stuff isn't that funny um, no it's wry if anything like it's sort of and she's cute. I mean, it's it's weird. She really doesn't have a big character. It's like, you know, she's it's not like she is in the last picture show where she's, you know, she's working against something there and she's, yeah. you know, kind of a nightmare. And I guess that's what she was cast for this from. Because it would have been the only thing anyone knew her from. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she is. I mean, she's very, very good at being enigmatic and sexy I mean, yeah she sells that the scene that that cottage sequence or the campfire how, i don't even know how to describe it the scene where we can't you know they take out their clothes but we won't touch there's a genuine crackle there it's not just him being an... now every version i've seen has that weird jump cut in it when they get closer and closer and closer and then suddenly it cuts to them laughing yeah i it, think it, that's intentional it felt like it's always been there because i know what the gag is obviously sure but it's weird that that jump cut is an odd cut, and I'm always I've always wondered if there is a version out there without that cut. I've never seen one. I know. I want. You know, it felt to me like it was an intentional, like an like a, an intentional explosion. It just it's it but is it's more yeah. It it's, reads it's like goes, a it's bad more TV edit than anything else in the film. Yeah, but it also like if it happened in a Cassavetes movie, it would feel totally natural. I guess so. So maybe it's just the new Hollywood at the time. That's anything goes it was such an odd, it's an odd cut it is uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other moments that hmm. in that film that s s like strike me as unusual oh I'll say oh the other thing I love about it is the opening song the You'll Go Far song yeah, yeah. it's that that sort of oddly optimistic uh, upbeat song is such a perfect contrast for the film itself mm -hmm. it just works perfectly like it, it, that's what it, that's what it, 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 everything that Elaine May sets out the the whole package of that movie works 
Um, and it's all her. I, I, she she really gets it. And it, it was an inspiration for Michael, by the way, when we were cutting the opening credits. Oh, yeah. Bob really wanted uh, Crazy, the song Crazy. And then I showed the editor, the Heartbreak Kid, and he used the Harry Nelson song uh, as a temp track. Oh. And we all saw it went, oh, that has to be it, that has to be it. And then a letter had to be written to the Nelson estate because it was it was the same idea. It was, if this is going to be a, a sort of depressing comedy about a codependent therapy patient relationship then the up the opening credits should be really upbeat um in a kind of ironic way yeah and that's what the heartbreak kid did so i totally push for that as a thief um, <laughs> but that idea um i yeah it's it's such a great it's such a great film everyone should watch it <laughs> i agree well i was reading some of the reviews after the like the, at the time uh the contemporary reviews and discovering a lot of people kept saying well it's like an answer to the graduate because of nichols and may oh that's interesting which is a weird yeah it's almost dismissive except that it is like by opening with the wedding that immediately goes sour it does kind of pick up from the last shot of the graduate where they're heading off into an uncertain future what if they just rejected each other? What if it didn't work? I, there's that weird vibe where I could sort of see with The Graduate being so important to people at the time because it didn't occur to me either time I watched the film. Oh my God, that it's, is so interesting. There's it, this weird echo, right? But it, yeah, it's not It's like not like it's shadow. picking it's not. It's, it's picking up in the story, but then obviously he's nothing like Dustin Hoffman. Right. But it is, it's not, it's like a weird, it's like a weird fuck you echo in kind of a way it's mm. like well you did the graduate now i'm going to do an even more downbeat yeah. wedding comedy where it's like the guy is never going to be happy you because it is like the graduate works so perfectly and then that ending is so stunningly beautiful but we don't really get a sense of that ending coming do you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. until it happens whereas the heartbreak kid it's telegraphing that ending from the very beginning yeah so it's uh, i think that the heartbreak kids a, a more mature film in the sense that it has less faith in its characters yeah than it, the graduate does it has no illusions yeah exactly exactly whereas with the graduate you can paper over the emotional uncertainty with simon and garfunkel and yeah yeah the, the gentleness of that film easing you out yeah and i'll say that i think mike nichols was a he was a better cinematic director um but he pulled his punches elaine may didn't yeah that's a really good way to put it it takes nothing away from what he did do but yeah her films are there's fewer of them and they hit harder yes absolutely she's to go back to the exposing part she really loves to expose people's flaws in a way that he was never totally comfortable with his films are beautiful and 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 uh, I mean, I wonder if it's just simply that he wanted to be a respectable storyteller, and she's not concerned with that. Maybe I mean, like Virginia Woolf is incredible, and that I would say is his most exposing film because he didn't write it because it was the play. Sure. Yeah. So, but he. I mean, you think about something like Char the later films like Closer and Charlie Wilson's War, the stuff that's supposed to be lacerating, but it's really just sort of gentle. It's very gentle. He's a very gentle filmmaker. And it's interesting because when you look at their material as well, she was the one going to great lengths to play horrible characters. And he was often the sort of straight man or uh, he always sort of played a bit of an uptight kind of, uh, you know, Protestant yeah. white male. And she would just she went for the laughs and, and, and the jugular and didn't mind looking bad or humiliating herself for uh, the vulnerability of a character. And he did it at times as well, but often um, at her goading him into it. Yeah, she was always the instigator. Yeah. It just, it was funnier to have him break under her, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a, do you know the Little More Gauze sketch they oh, did? Oh, yeah, sure. So that's, that's probably the first one I ever heard. That's the one I think of when I think of him breaking, right? Because it's like, he's so in love with her, he can't contain it while they're in the middle of a surgery. And that's the one where I think of him being the most, because other times he gets frustrated with her, but there's a difference between being frustrated and being lovesick yeah powerless yeah yeah exactly 
like the telephone thing, he's getting irritated, but it's a different kind of thing. It's like, uh, it's, it's being irritated with someone that you see as beneath you. Whereas the little more gauze, he's lovesick and powerless to this woman who, who is, who holds all, all the cards and he, he desperately wants her affection. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I think, I think that's interesting in terms of looking at his way of filmmaking and her way of filmmaking and the way that they were together as a comedic duo. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and so this kind of, this sort of naturally leads to the, to the closer, which is, you know, and you've already kind of answered it, but what of the heartbreak kid have you incorporated into your own work or stolen or lifted or, or stitched into your DNA? Well, How the, does it come out? Just so the, the theme song part, obviously in Michael, sure, yeah. but the, the, what I love about it is the, um, and how I've tried to incorporate it. It hasn't, it hasn't worked its way into anything that's been made. Okay. I had one film that uh, Greenberg put a lot of money into um, that's sitting on a shelf. And and that was very similar in tone and feel um, of characters being deluded into thinking that they were making the right choice, but it obviously wasn't. And because it was out of love, they felt... Uh, vindicated in their poor choices so there's there was that but then there's something about the dialogue and the i like the i like how vulnerable the characters are in a way that you don't totally empathize with them so it's not that they're anti-heroes or bad people although charles Grodin is a bad person sure it's, it's that it's that they're believably weak and I try to work that into the stuff that I write because I just love those kinds of characters. I think it's a lot more interesting to see that than someone who's just an alcoholic. You know, it's like this mm. person has no boundaries when it comes to pursuing something that he wants. Again, that's way more interesting than he's got a booze problem. Right. So if you're going to write your flaws, it's like try to come up with something that is relatable but also maybe something you haven't seen before. Yeah. Again, I just wish I could have seen this with an audience at the time. They must never have seen anything like it. Can we get it for the Royal or something? Would that be possible? Like, someone must have a... Would, how does that work? Who, who, who You need you... to find the rights, and, and then from there, I guess you need to find out if Fox has a DCP of it, if Fox even still owns the rights. Right, because who knows who would own the rights yeah. now? Well, I will not rest until I have a Blu-ray of it. I mean, I'll probably rest. It'll happen at some point. It has to happen. I got it. It's, uh, that's my yearly email to Criterion, by the way. It really is. It's it's please put together an Elaine May box set. Because also I think that it's, you know, how great would it be to have uh, more female directors represented under the Criterion sure. label? And mm-hmm. she's a great one. And she's totally underrepresented generally. Yeah. Well, maybe you start with one and work your way up and certainly I know Anchor Bay has the rights had the rights to the Heartbreak Kid and Mikey and Nikki so maybe that's the leverage find out where those ended up alright Criterion we're coming for you hey my thanks to Matt Watts who's back on your TV set this Sunday January 15th as Michael Every Day returns to CBC if you like your comedy awkward and neurotic this is certainly that you can catch up on the show's first season Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays at cbc.ca slash Michael you should do that you can find Matt on Twitter at Matty Watts, all one word. And while the Heartbreak Kid is currently out of print, the Anchor Bay DVDs are definitely out there. If there's still a video store in your neighborhood, it might even have one. So maybe start there while Matt and I beg Criterion for the upgrade. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you want to leave a review on iTunes, that would be very kind of you. We need them to live. Thanks for listening. I'm afraid you just too darn loud.